disregard a broken bottle top and one man's soul they follow each other on the wind you know because they've got nowhere to go that's why I want you to know Change his ways. Now, no 
wanna make the world a better place Take a look at yourself and make that change na, na, na. Selfish kind of love It's time that I realize There are some with no homes Not a nickel to loan Could it be really me Pretending that they're not alone A widow deeply scarred Somebody's broken heart And a washed out dream they follow the patterns of the wind you see Because they've got nowhere to be That's why I'm starting with me I'm starting with the world in that mirror I'm asking her to change her ways Now no message could have been yourself and make that Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's give it up for the Glad Ensemble one more time. So for those of you who don't know, I am the grandson of uh, Janice Maricatani and Cece Williams, who we are here for tonight. Tonight, we are going to watch a film where we see a young 41-year-old C.C. Williams back in the day. Um, we're going to see what he's passionate about and why he is passionate. And after watching this film, uh, three words come to my mind after watching this film. Happiness, energy, and thankful. And the reason why these three words come to my mind is because it makes me happy to see that there is somebody who is out there uh, that has been fighting for people their whole life. Um, in this film, you get to see the intensity and the, the passion that my grandfather has for helping people out. And this film is important for those because you get to see my grandfather fight for those who do not have a voice. Um, so I'm happy. <laughs> This film is in partnership with the Tenderloin Museum director, Mr. Robert Shaw. 
and filmmaker Bob Zagoni. Is Mr. Come up, come up. Randy, Sh Randy Shaw and Bob Zagoni, come up. Talking to this. Yeah. No, 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 you can talk. Well, I, I want to. I just, I just wanted to again uh, say that it was, if you haven't been to the museum, which is just a few blocks away under the Cadillac Hotel, I would strongly encourage it, become a member. There's, you know, exhibits on Glide, on Janice and, and Cecil and the amazing work. And I can say in writing my book on the Tenderloin and putting together the exhibits for the museum, I discovered a whole world of Cecil Williams from the early 60s that I wasn't even aware of his role in starting the gay and lesbian rights movement in San Francisco, and just, he's got so many histories, it's like, it's remarkable. And this film, which discovered, is part of that. And I should say that, as great as it is that we discovered this film as part of a lost history of Reverend Williams, here tonight with Reverend Williams, and then when Willie Brown, who I believe will be, be coming shortly, we have in this room two of the probably 10, if not five, most influential San Franciscans over the last 50 years here tonight. So, so this very night we're making history as well. So and I'll pass it on to Bob Zagoni, my neighbor, who will tell you how we got to this point with the film. And again, thank you all, Glide, and thanks for the support for the Tenoy Museum. Willie just missed my great introduction of him. So Willie, Willie, I was just saying, I want to make sure Willie hears that I just credited you and Cecil with being two of the 10, if not the most five influential San Franciscans of the last 50 years. So make, that's history. First of all, I'm so honored to be here tonight in the presence of Reverend Cecil Williams and Jan. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, Jan said, keep it short, but it's gonna be hard to deal with 42 years, <laughs> and, but I'll do it in four minutes and two seconds. Uh, uh, I'm already uh, emotionally drawn. Uh, my good friend, Napata, who sang, Oh Happy Day, I had no idea she was going to be here tonight, and she's one of the best singers in the Bay Area and the whole country, so thank you, Napata. <laughs> she's a great, she's the greatest. So I want to tell you uh, how we got here tonight with this video. Um, I was asked to go uh, work on a project in New York, uh, by an old colleague and friend, Tony Batten, who had worked on 60 Minutes 2020 and was one of the original producers on uh, the famous Black Journal show. And we did a multi multicultural show about the African American experience and the Latino experience. We did shows about Paul Robeson uh, busing in South Boston, very scary. Uh, also uh, shows with Gil Scott Heron, uh, Les McCann, our own Taj Mahal, uh, the great Yubi Blake, uh, who's uh, uh, one of our great American composers. His Broadway show of 1923, Shuffle Along, is being revived right now on Broadway. So uh, he, he was an amazing man. We also did a documentary about uh, three generations of Latina women, the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter. Uh, I was the, uh, the only gringo on the, uh, <laughs> on the staff, uh, and uh, I, I like to have thought of myself as the only Sicilian on the, on the staff, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, we, our staff in this show was uh, diverse before the word was coined diverse. Uh, and uh, it was unheard of in television in 1974. Uh, it ran, the show you're going to see tonight, which is 30 minutes long, ran one time on PBS and then it disappeared. Uh, when I connected with the Tenderloin Museum, I told Randy about uh, the video. And he says, well, I've got to see it. We, we'll run it at the Tenderloin Museum. So I looked through all my Rat Pack of videos, and I found a three-quarter inch video 
of the Cecil Williams Interface Show. And uh, if you don't know what three quarters inch is, it's way before digital, <laughs> way before. So uh, I had it transferred to DVD uh, at my source in Berkeley, and they couldn't transfer it. It kept getting glitches. They, they worked on it for two weeks. And I said, oh, no, this is, this is bad, because old tapes uh, tend to deteriorate. So um, I called up WETA in Washington, D.C., where we did our post-production. And I found an archivist, and he said, well, all the shows are at the Library of Congress. So I contacted the Library of Congress, and, uh, and they said, oh, my god, these shows are great. Well, well, we'll make a video for you. It'll cost you 70 bucks, and it'll take six to eight weeks. <laughs> I said, great, let's do it. Then I got an email a few days later, and they said, we can't find the tapes. <laughs> and I immediately thought of, uh, of Citizen Kane and the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> that Cecil Williams is, is, is caught in this vast warehouse of videotapes and they can't find it. Well, I do have an archivist in LA who uh, uh, distributes some of my old shows, uh, Retro Video. So I sent it down there and they have a lot of bells and whistles down there because they're always doing this. And they actually salvage the tape. So as far as I know, I'm the only one, and Cecil and Jan, who have copies of this show, and uh, you're going to have a good time watching it and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Glide's reasons for being Glide was on full display in the movie. As you listen to Cecil and the sermons, as you listen to the interview. You know how many years ago that was? But how incredibly relevant each one of the comments made by Cecil are today. When it was sent over to me with specific instructions, watch it and send it back. <laughs> Do not copy. I was so fascinated that I dropped my follow-up watch. I was going to watch Empire. <laughs> but Cecil ruined my watch opportunity for empire, other people. It was just incredible to have my friend of so many years. And you, you, you could have been here on those days and you wouldn't have heard it the same way you hear it today because over the last 30 years, so much has happened in this world that clearly was anticipated and projected by what Cecil was doing here at Glide and the contribution that was making to humankind and in particular to San Francisco. It literally was a life-changing experience to be a part of what Cecil was doing here at Glide. And at the time, you were unaware you were being totally and completely changed by virtue of this incredible man who was doing all the things that he did so profoundly. And so I'm glad that in the world of the kind of taping that people could do and the kind of video that people can do and the kind of movies, that the quality of the sound was so uh, incredible. You know, it's a long time ago. You didn't have all this social media and all this digital and all the kinds of things that you have today. These were skilled technicians who must have been overjoyed at being able to be the witness and the listening ear to everything that was occurring. I bet you when it's shown again, I hope, 
on, on PBS, uh, one of the proper channels. Just think of how many of those people that came from Buffalo and other places are going to see themselves, and they're not going to recognize themselves, because I'm sure they don't look the same today. Uh, because, you know, I was a little bit jealous because my natural <laughs> never got like Cecil's natural. <laughs> and when it opened with Cecil doing the number, it was something special. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love you too. Love you too. And you know it. You know it. I uh, walked through those doors the first Sunday that I had been appointed to glide by a white bishop named Donald Tippett. The first day that I walked through those doors that Sunday was a, a, a real scene because I came up the aisle and there were four people who were singing and there were about 10 people in the audience. And I said, where are the rest of the folks? To somebody, <laughs> somebody back there. And they said, we're all here. And I said, really? I said, the bishop didn't tell me that he only had about 15 members or 30, well, it was really about 35 members. But I came up and I could tell that they were uptight and very, very difficult. And so we went through just the motions, I would say, and turned out uh, in about 45 minutes. But I vowed that when I would come back again, that it would begin to change. I didn't do it immediately, like the next Sunday, but three Sundays later, <laughs> three Sundays later, I had decided that I was going to, there was an altar there with a Bible on it uh, down there. And, and I decided that I was going to say to, at the altar, oh, we're going to change, we're going to change. Because I had begun to feel it very strongly that we had to change and completely, I'm talking about completely, I'm not talking about change portions of what we were doing or what we were, would have to do, but I'm talking about fully. We had to change the whole atmosphere all the hymn books, everything, everything, literally everything that we did in this sanctuary, and as well as the few programs we had later on. Uh, we had to change them, everything. And so the third Sunday, I started the preaching down there, and that hit me, because what I said when I got there is I'm going to be with people who are living life with voice, without voices. And I, some of the people got up and walked out. And I said, uh-huh, I got you, I'll get you. So the next Sunday, next Sunday, when I started preaching, rather than them walk out, I went back there to the door and stood at the door. <laughs> and I said to them, you can leave now, but I'm gonna keep it getting you. You're gonna come back, you're gonna come back because you can't give up all of this, not all of this. And, and the organist was playing and they sang a song and it was about over. But what I want to finally say is it, it hit me that this was probably one of the most critical experiments that we could engage in. You know, here is a hardcore Southern Methodist, by the way, church, Methodist church. It was a Southern Methodist church. And, and, and I had the opportunity to open up possibilities here. And, and that's exactly what I, I did. I stood at that door. And from then on, they knew that they had tackled something very critical. And so I said at that time, I was going to commit myself to making sure that the church would be full one of these days. And in a and, and about three months later, Ralph Gleason put in the Chronicle paper that Cecil Williams, Haydn, and Handel came down the center aisle, and the church was full, and the people were listening to John Handy play work. 
That was a song. You remember that song? Work? Yeah. And John Handy, John Handy, and they came down the front aisle, and I walked up to the front and said to the people, it's over. It's over. You will not live longer the way that we've been living. The church is now the church. And basically, the bottom line was, of course, if you're really into what I came up on in my theology, was basically it was just one thing which was critical. First, first, first and foremost, stay with the poor, work with the poor. And there's power when you work with the poor because you become empowered with them and you must be one who stay with them, even if it means giving up everything you got. Commit yourself to giving up everything you have if you're going to participate with the poor. And I committed myself, even though I didn't give up everything. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's how it came about. It didn't help the, yeah. the standing congregation of 35 folks when he had the first national hookers convention in the sanctuary. Janice, why don't you, why don't you tell, tell, <laughs> Cecil, the world probably doesn't know that you referenced the bishop. How long did you keep the bishop out of glide? It's very interesting that you would ask that question because Bishop Tippett had been working in New York and he had been working with gangs and in the lower parts of New York where uh, the issues were sharp and apparent there as well as in San Francisco. So what he said to me was, I said to him, Bishop, I'm going to turn this church upside down. And he said, do it. And I said, thank you. And what happened was, I became his minister. He called me his minister in the ministry. He, he said to me, you are mine. I'm going to claim you. And I have a letter where he wrote me that, these words, when he said, I want to claim you as my son in the ministry. And we did, of course. He supported me all the way, no matter what happened. He was there. He was there. that time creating the programs as we know them today. I'm beginning with the meals program, beginning with the children's program and the families programs. Um, but I was uh, trying to get my master's degree at, at San Francisco State University after having taught a couple of years of school. And when I met Cecil, I said, oh my God, I can't go back to school. There's just too much going on out here. He was like a hurricane trying to bottle a hurricane. And I said, you know, I think this guy needs some structure, so let me. <laughs> let me see what we can do to do that. And um, you know, what Rudy was to you, I, I think I brought a little of that to Cecil, because you could see he was flying around all over the place, and he needed, he needed a, a, a landing space, right? <laughs> And we needed to be able to raise money for the programs. We needed to be able to have some infrastructure. We needed to be able to have some, something that wasn't so spontaneous every moment. So uh, 
And you know, that fro of his, they had to widen the doors for his... <laughs> for his fro and his ego. <laughs> Cecil, you talked about, you dropped three or four or five names. You talked about Ralph Gleason, who wrote for the Chronicle in the old days. And you talked about John Handy. Share with us, if you will, what kind of outreach did you do at the outset to get that kind of attention for Glide and what you were attempting to do here at Glide that literally went worldwide without being viral? <laughs> You know, uh, there are several things that happened to me in regards to what we would call my theology. Uh, I was, come, of course, came out of a Methodist church. It was uh, mid-conservative, I would say. Uh, we did every once in a while do something that was a little uh, out of order, but we followed the Methodist ritual and the rest of the Methodist direction and so forth. But what was so important to me was to find a theology that would keep me with the poor and a theology that would open me up to the world. And I came upon, of course, two things first and foremost. Unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. Now, if you've got unconditional love and unconditional acceptance, it allows you to work the work of what you call the church, or what you may be as, as you respond to the church. The church that I wanted was the church that I found when we came here and began to work, Jan and I. And it was a church that said, we are in need, great need and people were outside trying to get in. And the white congregation that was here did not want anybody of color here. In fact, they were very put out because the bishop appointed me, of course. And after I heard them put me down on Sunday mornings, I would be walking, coming to the sanctuary, and, and I could hear them talking about this man that, they, that the bishop sent to them. He should not have been sent us a, 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 a black man. And of yeah, course... They weren't that nice. No, they weren't that nice. <laughs> That's right. It was awful. I had to put up with more... I was called everything, everything, on, when I would see them, you know, when they would come here. Uh, but the important thing that occurred was unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. That opened me up. But what else opened me up was what is called liberation theology. Liberation. To be liberated is to be empowered. And to be empowered is to make sure that you are empowered, but, the, but you stay close to that which is the worst in the community. And that's, of course, the, the poor. Stay close to the poor. Make sure that the poor becomes your priority. And that's exactly what we, that's why we began this food program because we wanted to make sure that we stayed close to the people, to those who were, who were in great need and had no voice. So being a liberation theologian allowed me the opportunity to really take on the world, all segments of the world. And so that's where I plowed my, 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 my understanding and my action. My action was always based upon being with the poor first and foremost. The poor get poor, the rich get richer. All that kind of dynamic playing against uh, what was taking place. And so f that now, of course, uh, I feel very strongly that uh, Jesus was uh, radical, and that he was not a nice milk toast kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> one. Can I just jump in for a second to respond to Mayor Brown's question about, you know, Gleason and having all these people um, begin to pay attention to what you were doing. Cecil was the premier 
press attraction. He was a magnet to the press, knew how to get the attention, knew how to dramatically um, express our protest against racism, and he would sit in front of the buses, he would stand with the community in front of the buses. He also, I think, really understood power. So he was not afraid to sit with the mayor, every single mayor, and thank you, Mayor Brown, for helping us to build those buildings. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, and he could sit with, you know, chief, the um, police chiefs who were attacking the Black Panthers. He could go to Marin County and be with Angela Davis. And, you know, I mean, it was a very, he was very daring. Uh, he dared the press to cover him. Uh, and I was there to call the press when I'm, when he was in jail. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I think he had this instinct that is, is really quite um, unusual. Wouldn't you say, Mayor Brown? I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Along with that, it's a good thing that we had a mayor and uh, 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 certainly a lawyer like Willie Brown, because uh, on several occasions there, uh, when Jan was trying to get me out of jail, Willie Brown had called him and said, let the man go, you know. <laughs> but, but he and I sort of came along at the same time. We came to San Francisco rather close together. But then through the years, whatever took place, we had a, a, a time together in making it happen, or even separate. You know, he would do certain things and I would do certain things. And of course, Jan played a major role in what, what happened. Uh, many times, behind the scenes, trying to get discernment for what she could do in, in getting me out of jail, or making something else happen, of organizing people. She became a very good organizer, and she still is, very much so. Very good organizer. We, we would organize buses because you were not having an easy time up there either, being an African-American assembly person. Yeah, when, when he, and we had to take buses up the there speaker, to protest. Yeah, when he was trying, running for Speaker of the House. You remember us going up there and yes, buses? Yes, and you know, they were like really um, blocking you, weren't they? Well, what they said, you know, we went up and took bus loads up there to make sure that Willie was elected to become the Speaker of the House. And we, we lobbied certain uh, politicians to, to give him, to make sure that he got that position. Uh, well, we found out some of the politicians said to us, he's too smart, so therefore we go, we're going to go against him. Now, he's too smart. So I went in, that, in his office and told him, I said, Willie, they think you're too smart. <laughs> and it shocked him, I'm sure. Because what we discovered, what we discovered is that they were not as smart as they thought they were. <laughs> Still too smart. <laughs> yeah. How many, how many books has it come out of the two of you since the beginning here at Glide? And that's now 50 years ago. Yeah. How many books that recounts and recalls and can so inform people about what Glide has done to the Tenderloin in San Francisco, and it will all be contained in your writings. So how many are there? I have five books of poetry. We ha he has authored two three, books, three, three. and we've co-authored one book. So oh, I'd yeah, say, well, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and we've done several books of anthologies uh, of the stories of people here in the community, children here in the community, as well as other anthologies that gave voice to many other ethnic communities who were not being published. So I would say that we have had a movement here of giving voice to people whose stories needed to be heard 
because I think it's so much easier to dehumanize somebody when you don't see how alike you are with them and with what their lives are. And I take it that in the Tenderloin Museum, for the newcomers, so to speak, these documents and these books are all probably there or can be secured through the museum, the Tenderloin Museum, I would assume. Yes. We're very proud of the Tenderloin Museum and yes, we're so we proud are. of our partnership. Thank yes, you very we are. much. We certainly are. You know, Cecil, in that movie, and they call it the lost footage, but it's totally consistent because one of the things you also said in that movie is that the true and appropriate measurement for providing leadership to people is unconditional love. Yeah. That gentleman was expressing the results of unconditional love. I must also say, Cecil, when we go to reception, you are and Glide literally is the only faith-based organization in the city that has not varied one iota in all the years that you've been here. Since the 60s, there have been no difference. People come and go, but Glide remains the foundation for all of us. And we thank you very, very, very much. It's been so many years. In the early times when Cecil and Jan would leave town for a weekend to go spread some love or do some speech making some other place, I'd get the call and said, you got to come and be there on Sunday to replace Cecil. So, no, I can't replace Cecil but I'm gonna be there on Sunday to try to make people think I am Cecil. <laughs> Mayor Brown, I have to tell the people this, that a lot of guys in jail, and unfortunately we have a disproportionate number of African Americans in prison, but about 40% of them, when they say, who is your father? Half of them say, Willie Brown? And have them say Cecil Williams. <laughs> We've been working a long Yes, yes. <laughs> We've been working out a long time. Yeah. You know, there is a great possibility that germination will occur here that we will all come together again in different ways, but never forget that we still have a task, that we must make sure that the world understands that there is a place and a people who will never give up on humanity. And we will bring, hopefully, love to the world. Love, love, love. And Ladies and gentlemen, our Cecil Williams. Our Cecil Williams. My fellow Texan, San Angelo, Texas. Mineola, Texas. <laughs> Mineola, Texas. What's your hometown? What's your hometown? What's huh? your hometown? What's yeah. your hometown? Mineola. Mineola, that's right. I got it to say this to you real quick. We, Willie Brown, they had a, at Willie Brown's 
hometown, they had a Willie Brown weekend, a week, a day's celebration of Willie Brown. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and he pointed it out. We went down with him on, on a, flew down on a plane, and we, he had all the, for the folks who know him and all this kind of stuff and everything. But I'm telling you, for anybody to change the people in Minneola, they have to be extra, extra, and he did. I'm telling you, those folks down there, they never, I think they'd forgotten him, but when he went, went back down there, he just showed them up and said, hey, Willie, hey, we're glad to see you, you're back home. So you're a breaker, man. You, you break down barriers. You've been breaking down barriers a long time. And I want to say publicly to you, if it hadn't been for you also, we would not be here. You helped us. You put it Glide has always had my back. Thank you. Thank you.